Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining from today. My name is Victoria Landau, and for the next minutes I will be discussing much knowledge but no power, present challenges and future potential of ancient heritage databases. To understand the situation of ancient heritage data, we should first touch upon what we consider to be ancient heritage at all. Because when it comes to ancient heritage, or antiquity for that matter, we have a disciplinary problem, and a problem of disciplines. The study of quote-unquote antiquity, specifically Altertumswissenschaften from the German, is spread across different time periods, regions, topics of interest, and scopes. When we tighten this definition by what is, especially from an originally European perspective, considered classical antiquity, the selection becomes even smaller. Disciplinary lines and limitations, as well as exclusion and isolation of disciplines altogether, majorly influence how well-saturated and multifaceted our image of any given ancient culture is. With a definition of antiquity studies like we've just seen, the scope of ancient heritage ends up looking something like this, and this geographic extent is being generous to the North and East. While having a border to one's discipline can help streamline research and offer a disciplinary identity, it can result in scholarship that is disjointed, such as disregarding similar expressions of culture somewhat outside one's field. What we end up with are scattered institutes, unconnected fields of study, and in the worst case, lack of access to disciplines for prospective students. For example, if you've ever been interested in Egyptian hieroglyphs, you might have discovered a link which is at first glance unexpected, a comparison to Mayan culture, which also used a hieroglyphic script. Yet you will be hard pressed to find universities which offer both Egyptology and Mayan studies. It is especially within sub-disciplines that broader viewpoints have been implemented, with approaches from the social sciences and expansions into the natural sciences. What has previously been considered borrowing from fields outside ancient heritage disciplines is now termed simply inter- and transdisciplinary research. And this is where modern ancient heritage repositories come in. So let's take a look at how the internet is solving some general problems. Now, I am an ancient historian, having worked on Greek or Roman Egypt specifically. As a PhD student in digital humanities in Basel, I focus on cultural heritage, especially what I would term ancient heritage and data management. This Herodotus quote from this talk's title sums up a central issue facing scholars and institutions alike. It is the most hateful pain among humans to have much knowledge but no power. At the moment, research institutions are in possession of the necessary know-how, and cultural institutions are in possession of the actual objects of research. Yet they are usually impeded from creating extensive open access repositories. Language, both ancient and modern, can be a hurdle, which feeds into the more general issue of accessibility and finally longevity, the aim to ensure access for as long a time as possible. In short, alongside missing needed know-how, these are all issues normally leading back to insufficient funding. The humanities are not in the business of giving up, however, so community has risen to address these challenges in a practical manner. By banding together, exchanging resources, and organizing informally, scholars have been sharing the burden of lacking infrastructure. Increasingly connected repositories have also been developed, which can bridge smaller databases, pick up neglected or discontinued databases, and provide objects with stable identifiers. The community supports one another in many ways, and the increased use of IIIF in museum and institutional online collections is making visual material, which is often neglected, accessible, plus introducing the option of reuse. A lot of responsibility ends up with the institutions, both those housing scholars and those housing ancient material evidence. Many, however, shirk their duty. It is not enough for institutions to applaud projects producing solid data management plans, rather they should have mechanisms in place to actively support. Holding institutional and funding bodies accountable for a lack of such support may improve the situation. So how are these improvements showing in our repositories? To what extent are we generating repositories which are usable and sustainable? For ancient heritage, one is arguably best served when accessing textual material. Since texts are central to most all disciplines, they are in some ways easier or at least more familiar to inventorize, categorize, and store physically and digitally. Two major examples of transdisciplinary databases for the Greek or Roman period are papyri.info and Trismegistos. Papyri.info contains the papyrological navigator, a search function for the aggregated documents it houses, and the editor, a peer community reviewed interface for the online publication of ancient documents. It aggregates multiple previous data sets. Opis and the DDBDP, for example, are no longer separate databases, being exclusively accessible through Papyri.info. Its biggest issue, however, is funding, and it has been fundraising for years. Trismegistos offers metadata for ancient documents within Trismegistos texts. 
crucially providing each entry with a standard TMID. Documents are known by many names and identifiers, so Trismegistos has created a centralized solution to this problem. The platform has been expanding in a big way, including databases for collections, archives, places, and more. They've also introduced more educational elements, an On This Day featuring a text a day, and TM Gallery as a collection of notable artifacts. They have recently implemented a yearly subscription for full functionality of the page, but basic functions are still openly accessible. In this last part, I will highlight three examples of project-based and topic-based repositories. The Cuprianos database assembles magical texts written in Coptic and Greek, representing lived religion in Egypt from the 3rd to 12th century, a long period with a backdrop of profound change, such as experiencing the rise of both Christianity and Islam. The Grammatois project has dedicated itself to analyzing the physical structure of Greek documentary texts from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE. From this, they have generated a typology classifying texts according to formal document types. The Forecare database, short for 4th century Christian archaeological record of Egypt, is the ongoing product of the ERC-funded project Decrim. As a two-part database combining sites and artifacts, it records all material evidence of early Christianity for 4th century Egypt. As a research assistant, this past year I've worked on expanding the Forecare Artifacts database with comprehensive entries. All three databases fill a large gap for their respective users. They are all highly connected, making use of universal identifiers such as Trismegistos IDs, and linking to relevant partner projects, gazetteers, and repositories. Cuprianus and Forecare feature both transdisciplinary inputs and outputs, and are sure to be used by a wide audience. In sum, I would argue that we are not so much facing an unprecedented digital crisis with ancient heritage. Rather, the digital, in abstract terms, is the latest but not greatest hurdle of transdisciplinarity. Decisions have to be made regarding the extent of databases, the value of centralized resources versus smaller, potentially more easily fundable endeavors. While, for example, predetermined categorizations usual for project-based repositories can be limiting, they can also give site visitors a much-needed structure and guidance. In any case, this playing field is undoubtedly where the digital humanities will come to play, as the bridge between antiquity scholarship and computational expertise. Thank you for your attention.